Good morning to our data-minded friends out there, and it is now 1.29 a.m. this April 11th. First chart we're going to be looking at is as follows. Green loose states, for those not familiar, loose state means individual states which do not really have mask, solid mask mandates in place, as well as strict pandemic mitigation strategies versus those which do have mask mandates in place and strict pandemic mitigation tactics. So what we're noticing here is a real interesting um, basically pattern where green being those loose states and white being those tight states, look what's happened. You notice the separation beginning to occur. Now there could be some psychological aspects in reference to that where people feel like the pandemic is over and henceforth maybe getting tested less People are tend to feel not as well, are not going for testing, so on and so forth. But in reference to hospitalizations per 100,000, we're beginning to see a trend, not just with hospitalizations, but with cases. Not so much deaths are pretty close, but across the board on many fronts. And again, what this gap is here between tight and loose states represents a tremendous amount of collateral damage. Uh, reference to schools, delays in medical testing, elective surgery, so on and so forth. So basically, policymakers have to decide whether this is really worth it. And when now it goes to this, yeah, that's pretty intriguing. But let's get right into the research as follows because it is pretty dynamic. Here we go. First one, important as well. Vaccines and functional neurological disorder, a complex story, says expert. Reading from the excerpt, excerpt, some videos posted on social media showing people experiencing abnormal movements and walking difficulties after receiving a COVID-19 vaccine may be related to a functional neurological disorder, otherwise known as FND. Before I proceed, I'm going to read the one excerpt right here. Now, this is from Massachusetts General Hospital, or I should say the researchers from the hospital. They're not saying it one way or the other. All they're saying in particular is it requires further investigation, and the worst thing that can be done, the worst, is to conceal it or ignore it, but to proceed as follows. Millions of people watching these videos might conclude that the vaccine is either quite dangerous to produce such symptoms or that people in the videos are faking their symptoms. Both conclusions are incorrect. Quoting, now, FND, what is that? Functional neurological disorder is a disruption in brain's normal mechanisms for controlling the body and can be triggered by physical or emotional events, including head injury or medical or surgical procedure and vaccinations. Some people with FND have a heightened awareness of their body and increased state of arousal and threat which may hijack normal neural networks controlling voluntary movements. FND teaches us quite a bit about the complexity of the human brain. Now, proceed as follows. Individuals' awareness of motor control may be impaired with FND as the author. Basically, what they're implying is this. The vaccines came out. And vaccines often require a lot of what's called uh, aftermarket or post-marketing surveillance there really wasn't enough time to get a good bearing on what may or may not be a side effect of the vaccine because it was rushed in an emergency sense. So this is what is being speculated by the particular researcher. I'm not into introducing public share bias into my feeling of the vaccine pro or con. To me personally, they are nothing more than medicines. And although some political officials, per se, let's say a governor of Florida, may get banned or censored uh, for question and certain pandemic mitigation strategies, uh, we've been fairly fortunate because they've allowed us to have the, our dark corner of YouTube, per se, and allowed us to actually raise these questions or hypothesize or conjecture negative or positive. With that caveat in place, let us proceed as follows. Now we go to the detailed research. This is the researcher's primary concern. With regards to the intersection, reading from the, I want to give you the title of the right here so you can see it. And again, the links will be there for you to follow as well. So you can make your own conclusion. 
Again, a vaccine is a medicine. A medicine is a medicine is a medicine. There's good medicines, bad medicines, so on and so forth. That's I don't like this black and white type aspect where it's either someone questions one aspect of vaccine, then they're part of the vaccine hesitancy movement or anti-vaccine movement. Safe vaccines, not safe vaccines. That should be the argument. With regards to the intersection of FND, functional neurological disorder, and COVID-19 vaccinations, the response from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has so far been to reiterate the safety of the vaccines, mistake number one. Without directly addressing these cases, as concern grows, there is a need for healthcare officials to directly educate the public regarding this issue, post-marketing surveillance, i.e., a lack of direct messaging may be falsely perceived by the public that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is not properly surveilling adverse symptoms or even worse, concealing them. These patients may be feel unheard or ignored and that can raise more distrust with healthcare officials. And I'm telling you right now, they better get their act together because they're about to expand these vaccinations to children. And it now is becoming a whole different ball game. So this better be investigated. It needs to be have a risk to benefit ratio uh, incorporated into the policy making decisions. You just don't throw it out there and just see what happens. And very brave uh, for these medical professionals. They're not saying it does or doesn't, but you know what it is? When you have to worry about raising a concern or raising a question, you really have to start questioning the environment in which this pandemic strategies or mitigation strategies are being incorporated. Again, not pro or anti-vaccine, not pro or anti-medicine, but all a vaccine is is a medical uh, prophylactic per se. You know, whether it be injected, oral, whatever it comes down to be, inoculation, variolation, whatever you want to call it from whatever time frame, so on and so forth. Medicine is medicine, good and bad, period. So to proceed as follows. Another one, the anaphylactic in reference to COVID-19 vaccination. And this is all important. Now, this one you have to give credit to the CDC for because the CDC was one of the first to bring this up as we covered in videos a few months ago uh, in reference to polyethylene glycol. The CDC noticed it even. Again, it's there are really good people in these organizations and some of these organizations have uh, bureaucrats. So basically, there are heroes with inside the CDC, albeit not on the news 24-7, so, so be it. So to say as follows, new insights on the cause of anaphylactic following COVID-19 vaccination, the polyethylene glycol. I'm going to give links again on the YouTube channel because it's important uh, in reference to this particular research because it gives insight into what to look for, especially to those administering vaccines in the hospitals or individuals that may have questions to whether allergic to polyethylene glycol. Now, in the research that we brought about six months ago, they, no one's really is aware of a polyethylene glycol allergy per se. So when you see one case per million doses uh, in reference to uh, uh, anaphylactics, uh, you know, it's, it's higher than what they normally consider in the beginning, per se. And now with Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca and other vaccines uh, having some issues, it's tough to determine because they have in these hot spots. Is it psychological? Uh, is it because someone left a vaccine out it, in a climate which it should uh, which it end up denaturing? I don't know. But what happened is they give a good test here, the skin prick test in reference to polyethylene glycol. And it breaks down the information uh, for those medical professionals. And if there's a concern, it can be easily addressed and looked at fairly readily. And the link will be there in the YouTube thing. Now, one of my favorite research articles of the week as follows. Sunlight link with lower COVID-19 deaths. All right. You remember last week we did cover that. We covered sunlight in reference to basically the uh, making or should that you can't use the word make. In inactivating SARS-CoV-2 due to the, uh, they were trying to say between UVA and UVB uh, synergistic effect between the two, and they weren't talking UVC. This UVC, the, the 254, 232, the you know the spectrums and so on and so forth, were aware of already, but but in relatively less harmful UV radiation, which could be held in a public area, 
you have some powerful, powerful tools in mitigating uh, the pandemic through natural means. So sunlight linked with lower COVID-19, not the vitamin D, as expected in this particular research. The reason being is as follows. Now we've shown that the vitamin D levels before in Lombardy, Italy, and things like that, and so so forth, were related to having adequate levels of vitamin D were correlated with having a 51% lower transmission rate. But what they did here was quite intriguing. They looked in areas which had low UVB light. And the UVB aspect of it, for example, produce what produces significant vitamin D in the body. So they went to areas with UV, low UVB and basically focused more on the higher UVA. And this is what they speculate. On the explanation of the lower number of deaths, which, well, let me read first. Oh, let me go back up first. The observation reduction and risk of death from COVID-19 could not be explained by higher levels of vitamin D, the experts said. Only areas with insufficient levels of UVB to produce significant vitamin D in the body were included in the study. One explanation for the lower number of deaths, which the researchers are following up with, is that sunlight exposure causes the skin to release nitric oxide. This may reduce the ability of SARS coronavirus 2, the cause of COVID-19, to replicate and has been found in some lab studies. All right, now... We hear the word nitric oxide. That's going to open up a tremendous, tremendous door to a lot of researchers out there, which are going to go, wow, there's lots of things that can help with nitric oxide. Arginine, citrulline. Uh, we can look at beta alanine. We can look at other things as far as potentially uh, nitrates uh, from foods, so on and so forth. So now the door is wide open. If nitric oxide has been shown to help in reference to the release from sunlight, Wow, that opens up some powerful, powerful tools, which could be correlated with helping reduce the ability of SARS coronavirus 2 from uh, basically replicating. Now, the speculation here as far as cardiovascular health, so on and so forth, low and lower pressure is great. Now, look at the correlation information into the full study right here, UVA, uh, is here. And I think this is kilojoules uh, square meter. So let's begin. The mortality risk MRR in the USA falls by 29%. I to replicate the studies in Italy and England, they pulled the decline of mortality risk ratio of 32% across those three studies. Again, UVA. Now, the studies that we looked at last week were the environmental, the ambient light from UVA and UVB being synergistic in deactivating this particular virus. Remember in the beginning, it was there. The Defense Department released some studies on and so on and so forth, and it had some great, great potential. But then somebody somewhere said, hey, you know what? Let's uh, shelter in place. Let's isolate. Let's shut people off from the world. You know, put facial coverings on, body covering, hands covering, you got plastic gloves, this, that. You know, there was no way for UVA, UVB to even make it to these individuals, even if they were outside. When in reality, here you have the best tools appear to be the natural tools. And natural tools tend to be dietary, behavioral, as far as exercise, and ambient, uh, as far as the outdoors. Basic things. So that is incredibly, incredibly uh powerful research in reference to sunlight, UVA, UVB, not just ambient, but from actual benefit from contact of the skin. Now, how sunscreen may affect it, um, you know, I, I don't want to add publisher bias, but we probably already know how that's going to happen. So chances are in order to have a solid impact. Um, again, I'm not going to add publisher bias, but to proceed as follows. Next one. This has to do with university testing. I love this. Again, you got to give the British Medical Journal uh, a tremendous, uh, you know, thumbs up and congratulatory thing. The BMJ, remember when SARS-1 uh, came around? Who is the one that exposed the, uh, the corruption at the World Health Organization uh, for not revealing the conflict of interest that they had in reference to SARS-1 when it first came out? The British Medical Journal. They did a wonderful expose in it. British Medical Journal is also the one that exposed the conflict of interest to individuals who profited this time, SARS-CoV-2, uh, from being on the vaccine 
uh, recommendation boards, and at the same time, too, profiting from the vaccines that they were selling themselves. BMJ. So BMJ has really done a great job of being on the side of the individual and not the establishment. And this is a wonderful research article. Take a guess. How much does it cost? Now, look at this. Uh, among the 69 institutions that disclosed three months' worth of data, there was 1,649 positive results per 335,383 tests with a 0.5% positivity rate. How much do you think each one of those tests end up costing overall? There we go. Ba 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 ba. Which suggests the cost of asymptomatic testing in school, asymptomatic, remember the keyword there, could be as high as 120,000 pounds per case found. I would appreciate if someone does the currency uh, equivalency to US dollars, but 120,000 pounds per case found. It was at a half a percent positivity rate. Instead, it was crucial that the Department of Health and Social Care published an analysis of data that was collecting from universities in England. And they alluded to this. And the, 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 what they allude to is basically just people looking, trying to look good. She said, the whole thing is a desperate exercise. I love the BMJ. Desperate exercise in trying to get favorable publicity for number 10, which is their bureaucratic, uh, their bureaucratic establishment for those not familiar here in the United States. Trying to get rid of those of the Unova test mountain and trying to change the culture in the country. So that we start to think that regular tests for everybody is a worthwhile use of public resources. Quote, unquote, which it isn't. Isn't that beautiful? Again, doesn't mean I agree with everything the BMJ comes out with and so on and so forth. But you know what? At least, even if you're disagreeing with the BMJ, you know their best interest is they have you as their best interest, per se. And that's really, really kind of cool. So, uh, hats off to the British Medical Journal. Uh, but yeah, so 120,000 pounds per case found. And think about it, you know, next time with long-term care facilities, they should, I would love to see, for example, say the money being spent on this. Can you imagine a room, which basically, let's say there is a pandemic or you want to protect a vulnerable population in a long-term care facility where family and friends can meet, not Zoom or video conferencing, which we discovered before actually makes them feel more lonely, but, you know, they can visit and not be so lonely. And also another health benefit to help fight in the pandemic is not feeling isolated. So if you can remove those barriers and move that collateral glow, gloom in reference to crisis, uh, spike, uh, alarming rate, you know all the key words, and the rest is the lockdown, you know, the, the rest is prison terminology. To humanize people, to humanize, not dehumanize. Uh, yeah, let's do it right if it ever occurs again. Now, hopefully we have different people in charge by that time because this group has done not a great job. To proceed as follows, another one showing that personal responsibility in reference to COVID-19 is important in that health behaviors are probably one of the most mitigating factors out there. Not, I'm talking about masking up and so on and so forth, fine, whatever you want to do. But dietary behaviors, taking care of yourself, is probably the best way of building a firewall. And when you see these studies come out of vitamin D, zinc, selenium, and C, they're not trying to diminish the individual who did not have those positive behaviors in place prior to the pandemic. What they're attempting to do, these researchers, when I talk to them, is to empower individuals to take their destiny into their own hand, to basically make sure their immune system is strong so it can be prepared for any unknown variables that may come along in the future or threats. That's what they're trying to do. They're not trying to criticize people for having a bad diet. They're trying to say, hey, now is the time. This is the benefit. In this case, we're talking about fibers. Now, fibers, they notice with a correlation, is short-chain fatty acids. Uh, basically, remember in the beginning, too, they, they found that Tons of individuals having gastrointestinal problems. They started to relate. All these things have vanished. You know, somehow in the middle of the pandemic between lockdowns and masks, all of a sudden just vanished. No one talked about it anymore. Well, they were visited. And no, they found out the fiber doesn't rest, uh, cause SARS-CoV-2 to be less or whatever it is. 
but it has an anti-inflammatory effect to the production of short chain fatty acids, which has a correlation with improving the outcomes of individuals who are infected with less inflammation, less cytokine storm. So here they go. In addition, recent study point to major changes in patients' gut microbiome, including decrease in levels of bacteria that secrete short chain fatty acids. So they noticed that in the individuals which start, appear, uh, start having these gastrointestinal problems by fermenting diet. Short chain fatty acids are important to colon health, produced by fiber, and maintenance of intestinal barrier. The headline was high fiber diet may play a role in controlling inflammation associated with, with COVID-19. To read the excerpt, in vitro treatment of cells with these molecules reduce the expression of a gene that plays a key role in viral cell entry and cytokine receptor. Fiber, C, zinc. A lot of these things, outdoor activity, walking, sun, air, ventilation. Again, the researchers are trying to basically say, hey, instead of abdicating personal responsibility or control to these unknown individuals, take control of yourself. That's all it is. If you didn't do it by now, there's always time to say, just be ready. If you're that afraid, of becoming ill through a pandemic, then there's things you can do to alleviate those concerns. And what a better time than now. But also too, back to the shelter in place thing. Here we go. Journal of American Medical Association. This is more trivia. They found significant increase in weight over the post shelter in place, SIRP. Here's the, head type, the, the title, shelter in place being SIRP. The average weight gain of an individual per month from shelter in place was about a pound and a half weight gain per month following the SIP. Although this may not appear clinically important, prolonged effects of a curve with a pandemic might lead to substantial weight gain. And we already know from dysbiosis, from lack of activity, all the behaviors and positive behaviors, dietary behaviors, trying to eat well, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, it took years to get people in these habits and only months to basically take them all away. So again, uh, when we look that, well, let's go right into the, the graphs because then you can look at the, the trade-off. So the trade-off of tight restrictions and the trade-off of light restrictions. Here we are. So this is what we're looking at. So here you have all these tight restrictions and here you have all these loose restrictions. And these are hospitalizations per 100,000. So you're looking maybe a difference, uh, let's say, let's say November. You have 0.4 to maybe a, point, oh, a 0.04 to a 0.052. This, this little gap right here, if you're a policymaker, a decision maker, you have to look at the aspect. Is this worth bringing this green line down to this white line? Is that worth the collateral damage, closing schools down, school lunch programs, the elective surgeries, cancer diagnosis, uh, drug treatment centers? Uh, other social services, so on and so forth. And I'm not even going to talk about the rest of the world uh, having to deal with the pandemic mitigation uh, aspects of uh, food, vaccinations, as malaria, dengue, yellow fever, so on and so forth, uh, begin to ha start having adverse effects in other areas. But even then, if you did the best there and then all of a sudden, boom, you know, all in vain, what do you do? So let's bring us a little closer. This is what we have as of March. Green being your loose states, uh, not having a strict, uh, uh, not having really a strict pandemic mitigation strategy versus those which are the white, uh, having a strict pandemic mitigation strategy. If they would have put more invested into dietary behaviors or healthy behaviors, you know, instead of closing gyms down and things like that, uh, we could have a different trade-off. Again, you know, I'm a big, big advocate when dealing with these things is you have to have controls. Now we only have about 31 states with strict pandemic mitigation strategies where the other ones are not. We have enough controls to see exactly right now. Now that could be you know, confounding or conflation or whatever it is. But however though, even with confounding and conflation, yeah, there's still a pretty solid gap there. Now there is to proceed. All right, so let's go right to the top. Do, 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 do. Let's see if we run into anything real fast of interest. Here we go. Da 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 da. da. It was taking a long time. I promise I'm gonna go down. Let's do this way. You can tell I mess around with a lot of the stuff. So here we are. 
Let's start right here. Yeah, let's start right here. Let's start right here. Here's your hospitalizations. Remember the whole thing in the beginning was to flatten the curve? Well, it's kind of like climate change, just as a, a trivia question, or I should say to fear from the path. You know, part of the reason, for example, during the 70s and 80s, we never did much for, uh, you know, climate fighting climate change or whatever it was, is because we, as a generation that was around before, were told that we'd be running out of fuel. And I bring this up for a point. So basically, we weren't supposed to have any gasoline by now. So because all the bureaucrats said we're running out of fuel because fuel was from decaying dinosaurs. And remember, a lot of us learned that in the 60s. And so these decaying dinosaurs and the fuel was just going to be gone. So we had a gas crisis left and right. Then all of a sudden, the gas wasn't running out anymore. So now we have these other climate restriction things referenced to social engineering. Um, because they were wrong then, and now I'm, I'm expecting them to be right now. So, going with flatten the curve. Yeah, we also know how with flatten the curve. Well, now flatten the curve wasn't good enough anymore. Now I came down to other issues. Now they're gonna use COVID for other social engineering issues, which I think is a bad idea because you'll lose trust in the population. Hospital patients to COVID total inpatient beds. Here we are, red, here's your beds available. Boom, 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 boom. That's what I look at right there. And I digress, please forgive me. And we proceed, then we go to deaths per 100,000, no mask, loose restriction states. Focus, you see the patterns, interesting. And I'm not seeing really any rises. Keep in mind, this is deaths per 100,000. No mask, loose restriction states. Every time a state goes into that loose category, I throw it into with the list. And of course, we use some Python. Append the data frame. And new deaths per 100,000, tight restriction states. And Again, a little bit of spike there, a little spike there. Uh, you know, months and months of dysbiosis is going to play a role too. Think about that. If you, I mean, hand sanitizer is only healthy for so long until you disrupt the entire microbiome on the skin. Once you disrupt the microbiome on the skin, uh, you're taking away one of your main protective effects from getting weird stuff. Da 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 da. And deaths per hundred thousand. There we are. Mortality just basically like that. Lots of colored lines, lots of colored lines, lots of colored lines, lots of... Now, what I use this for here or here is I look for outliers because that usually means something went on. And that's part of the reason why it's there. And so here we are. We are going to look at our um, loose states. No, we'll pass on that one real fast. This is your loose states versus white states or tight states, I should say, on cases per 100,000 smooth. This is the cases, not the hospitalizations. See right there? White is your tight restriction states. Green is your loose restriction states. Think about it. Think of all the economic damage done uh, on these white states. Now, again, it's not for me to decide, but however, the numbers are numbers. They're Boolean, in effect. True or false. Uh, you know, how much collateral damage is caused by going from a 0.2 to a little over a 0.3 uh, per 100,000 in case of smooth. All right, and then here we are close up from March to April. All right, there we go. New case per 100,000, rolling seven, tight restriction states, right there, 124. Here we are, 99. And this is the loose states. You know, as far as, you know, there's Florida. Remember, Florida was supposed to fall apart, Texas. We, again, they are wrong so often. It's embarrassing. All right, here we go. Do do new cases. You can tell me when they were right. That means if you want to be argumentative, that's perfectly fine. Just tell me when they were right. New, and where the, and that's all you have to do. But when we look at controls, and if the controls are beating, yeah, they're here that you could say they're right. Maybe this is in deaths per hundred thousand smoothed. There we are. There is a little bit of a rise there between a. a basically between the tight states and loose states. Again, looking at that. Were they right? Or is this just this not beyond the level of statistical significance? There's that. Green loose states versus white tight states, that's per 100,000 rolling. Did a little tighter look at right there. There was a bit of a cross line right there, but it looks pretty much the same. And again, we're comparing apples to apples. So don't, this is per 100,000 population base. There's that, 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 this is 
Death Burner 1000 Smooth, Rolling 7. We just looked at that. Wow, it was deja vu. All right, here we are. Tire Restriction States. Cases per 100,000. Rise in Massachusetts. A rise in New Jersey. A rise in Hawaii. A rise, wow, in Vermont. Uh, Pennsylvania. Michigan. Minnesota. Rhode Island. No, Colorado, I should say. Take that back. Pennsylvania, which is ironic because isn't uh, the Major League Baseball going to Colorado? Uh, let's just look at them. I'm curious when we get to Georgia to see if they're rising up because otherwise you take an MLB game and you put them in an area where there's, you know, whatever's going on, but there's a rise in cases. Minnesota and Michigan. Look at the frick. What the heck is that? Look at that. And now let's go to Dennis, Connecticut. Let's go to our loose restriction states. Numbers and numbers. And that's all I'm going to show you. Here we go. A little bit of a rise in Arizona. Maybe Iowa. Oklahoma, there's that. There's your y-axis. A little bit of rise in North Dakota. West Virginia, no, that's I want. I'll take that as now. Nah, we'll wash. It's going back down. Mm, uh, maybe Florida. A little bit of a rise right there. Maybe a little bit of a rise in Wisconsin, like between like two and three people, compared to these again. When your pandemic mitigation strategy in the front of all of your controls is not working as anticipated, against correlations, not causation, and thank goodness I'm no Governor DeSantis, so hopefully YouTube be kind and do not censor this video. And they only censored one of my videos, and that was on Ivermectin a long time ago. And since then, they've been pretty tolerant. All right, loose restriction states. North Dakota, a little bit of rise. New cases burned 1,000. Everyone else, pretty much mostly down. I'd say Alaska, a little bit of an up. Tire restriction states? Hawaii? Keep in mind, the y-axis is not much to look at. New Jersey? What the heck is with Vermont? It's like, seriously. Um, not Oregon, nah, not much. New York? Michigan? Seriously? Minnesota? Wow. That's amazing. All right, back, look at this. This is what we just covered a few seconds ago. This is hospitalizations per 100,000. And again, green being loose, white being tight. It's a contest you do not want to win. And this is just the relate ratio between cost, uh, cases to hospitalization. I just found it frequently, uh, frequently uh, too close. And uh, this is just slight, loose states to tight states. So I want to basically get the numbers to make sure they're, out, they're appropriate. And make sure I did not do a calculation error. Error. And because, look at this. This is your tight states. And this is from January. And so this new case is the total uh, adult patients hospitalized. And they're pretty similar down the line. And so, you know, and people that are hospitalized can be hospitalized for 30 days or more. So I don't know whether I should do a, a, a 7 or 30 day shift in order to get more accurate finding. But. That's something we're going to look forward to in the future, if it's even pertinent. So, all right, let's proceed as follows. Let's go to our Monte Carlo. Ba, 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 ba. All right, new deaths current in the United States. All right, there we are, to April 10th. A little bit of a rise. And what Monte Carlo thing is this. What Monte Carlo is we, we take past, uh, past performance, per se. It's really used for stock uh, predicting stock outcomes or you know stock values. But in this case, I used it for the, I took the Monte Carlo and put it into reference to, um, you know, predicted. Now here, now what I did is I took the, if you notice what I did here, I took the 30% or basically number because the, there's the IHME, I believe, from Washington that usually says that masks prevent transmission of, uh, of uh, disease and mortality of, from face mask at 30%, which I strongly I uh, have not seen any data to support because the dead mass study said there's no statistical significance. And again, I, I'm not into I'm not into taking sides, just the numbers. And so I just threw in a 0.7 there because that represents 30 percent. And if I just to see if I could replicate the IHME uh, machine language model, and so that would be the prediction by 
July 19th, if everyone was wearing a mask according to the AHME, I'm trying to replicate their model, keep in mind. And no mask would be a result in, if you were a media organization, you would say, wow, 65, it'd be 30,000 more people for mortality if they don't wear masks, because that's how the AHME works. And, but don't pay attention to these numbers. This is just cumulative. They're not predictive of going up or down. Uh, so would you say ordinal? Uh, new cases per million prediction, Monte Carlo. Uh, again, this is what's called iteration, so it can go in any one of these directions. If we follow the current pattern as is, as of April 11th, we go from here, this is across the United States, potentially to something below the common cold. Uh, new deaths per million prediction, Monte Carlo. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. And again, there's some outliers there. If we follow this, it's be, you know, we have more data. When I originally did this back in June, it predicted the same thing, but then also we started testing, uh, you know, younger uh, groups, and then it threw everything into a uh, statistical array, away, whatever you want to call it. But here we go, COVID uh, world data. Here we go. Let's get to the top right real fast. Do 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 do. Here we go. Do 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 do. All right, here we are. This is the world. This is the case percentage. Remember, there's new variants and things like that. So you do see a rise, but you do not see a rise in mortality. And again, the mortality is this bottom line right there. And then the percentage of positive cases. Actually, the mortality is right about there. So you're looking still pretty high at about uh, globally. Uh, I probably blame most of this. I'm, I don't blame it, but it seems like Brazil is skewing it a little bit. Right about there. And then as we go down, to do the repetitive damage, repetitive damage, please forgive me. Uh, mortality percentage, two new deaths per million. There we are looking in global, but this is on a global level, keep in mind. So we were right, about 1.5, right there. And then new case per million. This is the countries we're looking at from the very beginning, so I don't want to change that. Sweden, cases per million, way up there. It was below everyone else, but however though, keep in mind, Deaths per million is quite low. There is the green line, which is the United States, the lockdown. And who is this? To see the colors are too close. Is that Great Britain? Yeah, Great Britain. Wow. Uh, cases moved, really dropped dramatically. Uh, way down. I mean, way, way down below our Asian friends. Let's go. There is the United States going down. A little bit of a rise there in April. We'll see how we go into June. Let's see, da, 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 positivity rates per se. That's when the great drop began uh, on January 11th. A little bit of rise there, it looks like a bottom out. Uh, but I'm not even concerned about that because we know the antigen test uh, for asymptomatic individuals really kind of uh, is not adequate. Uh, deaths per million, do, do a 72% false positive rate. And once I heard that, I said, how am I even supposed to use that in the data analyst? That, like, Including something with a 72% false positive rate really is not, I mean, eh. New deaths per million, there we go. Uh, USA still, unfortunately, ahead of the pack. Great Britain, uh, right here, down there. Again, they're going towards your friend. Sweden, uh, close second. Remember, these are only the countries that we're look, uh, we've kicked in as far as we're looking at. Uh, Sweden is at 1.74. United States has dropped, thank goodness, down to 2.965. All right, there we are, looking at that. United States versus all of Asia. Yeah, look at this. This is um, Armenia, uh, deaths per million, uh, total deaths per million. Yeah, Armenia, uh, of all places. And this is Armenia? I have to do an analysis to make sure. Uh, so here we are, mortality, USA versus all of Asia. Remember India, again, we spoke about it before, the Ganji, they had a big religious festival. Nothing happened. They all jumped in. It was supposed to be this massive pandemic. Again, once again, the, the predictions have been wrong. I'm waiting to see when they're going to be right. So here they are. And then mortality. Uh, Asia, out of 4 billion, 463 million people, has had a total mortality of 445,430. Uh, comparatively wise, United States with a population of approximately 329 million has had a total mortality of 561,782. 
That is one individual falling or succumbing to COVID-19 per 10,019 out of all of Asia compared to the United States at one out of every 585. All right, there's a population ratio. There's the world. Vaccines began to kick in. Uh, so mortality rates, really kind of hard press to say anything has to do with uh, vaccines because on a global scale, there's a percentage of people vaccinated compared to your cases. Proceed downward. Uh, Pull before vaccinated. Mm, yeah, you can't tell yet. That it, it could be a correlation. Uh, there's that, and then we go down, 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 down. I move a little faster. Cases uh, mortality percentage is your red, and in case new cases. There we are. Uh, basically, as far as percentage, there's no connection between mortality and vaccine, and we originally thought we were in the beginning. We wanted to keep an eye on. Who is this? Asia. Asia's like rising, but now Asia's rising in cases. But look at the mortality uh, in South America. That is really wildly high. And I don't know why, but there it is. That's the uh, one to keep an eye on. Cases have rose in Asia, but mortality is still very, very, very low comparatively. Brazil. Didn't even have much of a rise in, not Brazil, South America didn't even have much of a rise in cases, but the mortality, for whatever reason, skyrocketed. All right, so we go down. Let's look at this Asia. Look at that. Again, knowing the false positives of the antigen test, I'm not with asymptomatic individuals. I don't hold much weight on it, so I pay more attention to hospital rates and mortality. Uh, Africa, cases. Europe. The ebb and flowing, North America, we're doing pretty good, but again, depends on how a person looks. There's that, Oceania, pay attention to the y-axis, uh, South America, again, case is smoothed. It looks like it's on its way down, but I really would like to know why, not the fact it is. I like to have conjecture to why. That just seems weird. All right, and let's scroll down. Da 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 da. And going down, new cases overall. Remember the y-axis is a little different, each one. And then they share the y-axis, it changes the whole dynamic. And this is new cases overall, or I should say smoothed. I'm moving real fast, not giving a lot of explanation because most people have visited this channel quite, I mean, on a regular basis, so I don't want to be, uh, to re be too repetitive. Deaths, again. 600 out of 4 billion 463 million africa europe pretty stable united states getting better and better oceana south america what the heck seriously i keep on looking at that i would like i don't want to just look at it i want to know why and so there's that sharing the same y-axis to put in perspective you know even with that sharp visually enticing climb on the asia when you compare the same y-axis it puts it way in perspective. And then when you compare it out of, you know, 4 billion, 463 million people, even diminishes even further. South America, wow. All right, there's that. Cases per million, as we scroll down, there's that, there's that, there's that. Death per million, you can see pretty, even though the numbers pop up, all over the place as far as hospitalizations. It's pretty much flat. Ironically, Europe of all places has the worst deaths per million um, outcome out of all the continents. All right, and then here we are. That's why I wanted to pay more attention to Europe, new cases per million. It is, it's pretty bad as far as that. When you look at it this way in mortality per million, but then when you take the cases per million to mortality per million and you put it together, it looks like that, cases to mortality. You see what I mean? All right, let's go correlations real fast. Do, 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 do. I'm just gonna make sure I didn't miss anything. That's real, that's our um, heat map. Nothing dramatic. Uh, da, da, da. Let's look down here. Let me do one thing real fast. I saw the heat map. I just don't like the color spectrum. So what I'm gonna do is give it another run and come back to that in a second. 
Let's see, there's that, there's that. There's nothing, I'm just scrolling down to the pertinent information. There's the United States now compared to other parts of the world. Remember when we first showed it, it was 3.6, it went really super high. And now, then we ended at a 5.3, now it is about down to 2.965, which has improved dramatically. Let's see if our heat map came back up. Yeah, that doesn't look cool, does it? What the freaking heck? All right, one more. We'll come back to that again. Uh, masks. I get this information from our world and data, and it's it's sketchy because it doesn't look like it's been updated significantly. Our face coverings. The other way of saying it. No strong correlation in reference to anything. Again, this is not knocking the face coverings. The closest to it is maybe. That, that you, can't, you can't even correlate that at a 0.4. It was 0.5 or 0.6 maybe, I'd start saying, but 0.4, that could be random. So there's that. Uh, da, da, da. And then these are all the states, which are four, which is strict, which the United States is not. We only have 31 states, uh, you know, out of the, uh, you know, out of our group here um, with mask mandates per se. Out of the rest, you can't really classify it as a four. So again, I don't know what the accuracy, and now we only get down to one thing, not two, never none. Uh, a lot of places raised their levels to two. Looks like they may have dropped it, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's accurate for any stretch of the imagination. Um, deaths per million, we saw that. United States, we reviewed with the mask level. Remember in this case, in this, uh, this analysis, we're attempting to determine whether mask mandates uh, as a general rule make any difference. I'm not seeing it. Sweden, case per million went up, but however, though, we look at Sweden, for example, on the mortality rates, they were going up, but you notice we're, we may end up seeing a seasonal trend like this. Just keep that mentally in mind, mentally in mind. Just keep that in mind. All right, let's see. Brazil, again, that's, that's what's uh, skewing the entire South America, I think. Uh, but does, does the mass level make a difference? Well, remember, that's to be enforced, but you know, whatever. Japan, our Asian friends, again, a wonderful job. New Zealand, again, we looked at that, nothing dramatic. Finland, no, no, no. India, it's like it got really scary for a little bit, then it just, eh. In India, India, that's an interesting thing. I don't like to see the gap close like that. That always worries me. Test per thousand, case per million. Spain, <laughs> France, lockdown city, United Kingdom, uh, it seems to be becoming a success story, deaths per million, way, they went way up and way down. But you see this, this, this trend, it always, it's made, again, it may look like it's going to become a seasonal thing. So, but you can't say lockdown forever. Again, if you're, if your controls are not doing much worse than basically your, everything else, why endure that hardship? Uh, ba -ba, there's that, and so on and so forth. Population data, hospital occupancy, we're going to the United States. Here we go, ready? Doo -doo -doo. Here we are, just real fast, covering it. There's Alaska, really small title. And again, what we're looking at here, purple is inpatient beds, yellow is inpatient beds used, and blue is available. Again, back here is when they went maniacal with the lockdowns. Look, right now, it looks like it's lower than it was when it first started. Just as a heads up. All right, there's our columns. New York, same thing. Lower than when it first started. Uh, Florida, probably about the same as when it really started to happen back in May. Iowa, they're all showing the same pattern. Yeah, again, what these last a few here, um, we're looking at as far as the states, is a no mass states. Iowa, North Dakota, even though they had a massive rise, looked on the spike there, it was one of the highest rises of the no mass states. Didn't see much of a difference. Montana, eh? Mississippi, eh? Texas, I don't know what that was, but I'm keeping it there for a data anomaly. Not much different uh, as far as looks like. Looks like the the states with less restrictions are doing just as fine. Vaccine delivery. I'm not going to go around this because the reason being is AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson are part of the picture because there's so many recalls and problems. 
I stuck with the Pfizer Monero right now. So if everything was perfect, if everything was perfect, you vaccine would be delivered, your, this percentage of your population would be vaccinated according to the CDC data. And so there's the numbers as a whole. So we look at it, we're looking at our data sources as follows, is from these right here. These are the CDC data. So I don't know where some of these places get 40% and 50% because I'm going straight from the Centers for Disease Control and the Centers for Disease Control, if everything was delivered perfectly, would be right there. Now it could be the inclusion of the AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson, but I can't do that because millions and millions and millions of doses have problems. So again, so I stuck with the Pfizer Monero just to just to give us some stability. And next week, I'll include the AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson. All right, and then our COVID rebuild we just showed, and that's it. Let's end it a little early tonight, and so let's review our information that we looked at real fast. Let's go. Let's go backwards. Body weight change, about a pound and a half per month of shelter in place. And we are past over a year. Remember when they first started? Give us 15 days, we'll flatten the curve. And it was supposed to be over by Easter. And now it's next Easter. And so, again, if they're that wrong that often, we need better leadership. All these leadership that's at least better at guessing. High fiber diet, great little thing in reference to short chain fatty acids, reduce from inflammation if COVID is concerned. Uh, basically in your life, then this can help. And just it's just healthy overall. So just why not? Why why you have to wait to feel good uh, uh, for COVID to start changing your lifestyle? Uh, COVID testing, again, beautiful, beautiful article. I love that line uh, where basically says, for everybody is a worthwhile use of public resources, which it isn't. And you could, you could tell the frustration in the medical researchers. Half a percent positivity rate is 120,000 pounds per case found. Someone please do the currency conversion. All right, ultraviolet A. Again, we're not talking about ambient ultraviolet. We're actually talking how the sun affects you without utilizing vitamin D into the equation, nitric oxide. And so pretty, pretty cool uh, observational data. Not showing causative. It's showing there could be a strong correlation between nitric oxide from UVA because they eliminated UVB to keep the vitamin D levels at, uh, as low out of the equation as possible. And they did notice, for example, 29% to 32% reduction. Uh, pretty nice pretty nice research. Polyethylene glycol, again, if you're not certain you're allergic to it or not, and you tend to be prone to those allergies, probably not a bad thing to be tested for before getting administered a vaccine. And then, of course, a, uh, outcry. Uh, now, that's interesting. Now, this is from the Journal of American Medical Association. They published it there. And originally, it was from Massachusetts General Hospital. So all they're asking for is basically this. Look into it. They're not trying to create a vaccine hesitancy, as a famous word utilized by CNN. They did their special they released today on uh, measles. And how, if you listen to the CNN special on measles, which they did prior to the COVID pandemic, which they just released today, and you'll listen to it. It, you know, here's a here's a, an ailment. I'm not saying it was the right thing, but in the 60s and 70s, in the 80s, we usually have used to have measles parties, where people would get around and all the kids would get infected at once. And if you if those of that generation which are familiar with that, and then they hear the CNN report on measles outbreaks and lack of vaccination due to vaccine hesitancy, it, it, it is an amazing, amazing perspective of how you can take something which you thought was relatively uh, a, a hazard of the world, but not as hazardous as it appears. You listen to that report from CNN, uh, wow. It's just, you'd be terrified of even walking out of the house. All right, case in point, they're really, really good at what they do. And so I'm not saying I agree with the news. I'm saying as far as delivery and, and marketing crisis, yeah, they, they they can get your attention real effectively. I, I try to listen to both Fox News and CNN. I listen to a half hour of each each day to see where each is coming from because, I you know, you have to. Each, everyone has a point to make, even if it's emotional or factual. And so I try to listen to, to all the news stations. I make it a point 
just so I know. For situational awareness is a powerful tool. All right, and again, what we're looking at here is the functional neurological disorder. Pretty scary. Again, uh, without a lot of post-marketing surveillance and reference to these vaccines, uh, I would really heed the warning of the researchers here and just say, hey, build trust, investigate, uh, and determine. Show that you care and that you're not going to isolate a group that may be having a, a reaction, whether it be psychological or actually physiological. It's important to take their concerns and need. If you want to build trust, build trust. Again, Ralph for Channel signing off once again. Hope you find this information in use. We look forward to seeing you on Tuesday for our regular report. And again, a lot of data to cover. And if you've been with me this long, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. This is just really always enlightening every single week. This gives me an opportunity to go through a lot of the research. And I really do appreciate you listening. So again, catch you all later on. See you next time. Bye.